Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the second session of the Supported Employment in Connecticut. Um, we today will be dis, uh, discussing recovery and employment. Our presenters, Mark Costa and Kendall Atterbury, uh, will be presenting today's webinar, and Oscar Perez, uh, Perez will be facilitating uh, today's webinar. Next slide, please. Um, I would just like to go over a few housekeeping information um, with everyone. So the participant microphones will be muted. Uh, we recommend using the chat box if you have questions or technical difficulties throughout the webinar. Uh, this session is being recorded and it will be available on our website uh, tomorrow and we'll be emailing all of the registrants with the webinar link, or the, I mean the webinar recording and um, the slides. Uh, we will also be emailing everyone about the CEUs um, in the follow-up email. And if you do have any questions after today's session, you can always email us at newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. Next slide, please. Our team is composed of the Yale Program for Recovery and Community Health in partnership with C4 Innovations, Harvard University Department of Psychiatry, and the Center for Educational Improvement. The New England MHTTC, our mission is to use evidence-based means to disseminate evidence-based practices across the New England region. Recovery or our area of focus is recovery-oriented practices, including recovery support services within the context of recovery-oriented systems of care. And to ensure inclusion, or I apologize, to ensure the responsiveness of our work, we will actively develop and maintain a network of stakeholders from the six states of New England to guide our activities. And with that, I will pass it off to Oscar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for all, thank you everyone for being here today. I'm very fortunate to be presenting these next two presenters who have done a wonderful job. And our first presenter will be Mark Costa. Uh, he is a psychiatrist and an associate research scientist at the Yale Program for Recovery and Community Health, Department of Psychiatry, Yale School of Medicine. He is the project director of the Yale Postdoctoral Research Training Program to advance competitive integrated employment for, the people with, for people with psychiatric disabilities. Next slide. And our second presenter will be Kendall Otterberry. Um, she is a person with lived experience of psychiatric disabilities and a postdoctoral associate at the Yale University Program for Recovery and Community Health, where her research focuses on the meaning of work among persons with psychiatric disability. Kendall is also an LMSW in New York and a New York State Certified Peer Specialist. And we're gonna start off with Kendall. Thank you, Oscar, and welcome everyone um, to this afternoon's webinar. Um, I wanted to start a little bit about sort of re rethinking or, or thinking about what we think recovery is. Um, what I chose were three different definitions. There are others uh, on recovery. One, then they work. The Pat Deegan one is actually from 1996. I didn't have the citation when I put this up. But um, in 2014, SAMHSA defined recovery as a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness. I can't see the slide. Uh, live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. In 1996, Pat Deegan had a slightly different version, 
which was the goal of recovery is not to become normal. The goal is to embrace the human vocation of becoming more deeply, more fully human. And finally, early on in 1993, in sort of what has become a seminal article, Bill Anthony wrote, recovery is a deeply personal, unique process of changing one's attitudes, values, feelings, goals, skills, and or roles. It is a way of living a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life. Recovery involves the de development of a new meaning and purpose in one's life. Next slide, please. And the reason I, I wanted to raise this is what recovery means often is, is different to different people. Um, and as we think about recovery and employment, I just wanted to sort of put out a reminder that, that recovery looks different ways to different people. Next slide, please. So recovery looks a lot more like this, and we'll come back to this, than it does, next slide. Whoops, there should be one before that. But then this, next slide. Okay, two slides are missing. Go back a little bit. So there's a tendency when recovery became operationalized, as they say, when it, became, when it was given meaning and sort of looked at for outcomes to reduce something from those three, first three definitions, which were, are very much about a person sort of figuring out what the life they want to live means with or without you know, the, the symptoms of mental illness as, as people think about them. And over time, recovery has become very much about outcomes. It's become about um, sort of, you'll still hear medical, you know, medication compliance, um, you'll still hear sort of old, old words put to use in, in the idea, you know, showing up for appointments and all of this. And recovery didn't start out that way. It started out as a very personal idea and the idea that people could live well in the community with support, regardless of where they fell on the mental health spectrum. Um, and sometimes that gets a little bit lost as we search for specific outcomes. Um, next slide, please. So recovery doesn't mean one thing, but there is a something that's that's happened is recovery has been taken up in, in clinical language, which it's now given both to service providers and service users. When recovery was first introduced into sort of mental health services, it wasn't taken for granted. In fact, it was very new and it was a huge change from the idea that all people could hope for was a life where they maintained a sort of basic level of living and they really couldn't hope for more. The, the huge impact for states that have taken it up of recovery is that's no longer a view that's sort of accepted in the, in the sort of mainstream language, even if it occasionally pops up. But at the same time, it's become something that's just given and it's just used freely. And we don't always think about what it means. And it has sometimes become linked to clinical services and to symptom management and to medication compliance and some of the other important parts of living a life get lost. Um, so recovery, it's an ambiguous term. It doesn't fit neatly in the universal manualized or operational cap, operationalized categories that fall into either clinical recovery, personal recovery, or social recovery. It's all of those things. It's none of those things. It's a little bit of everything. Um, and it loses its meaning when it's too heavily predefined. So Part of recovery is being person-centered, which is probably at this point, because recovery has become more mainstream, really critical, especially for when we talk about employment. So being person-centered means really that we attend to the unique singularity of the person in front of us. So as service providers, when we're meeting service users, what they want and how they want to move towards their goals becomes really central. And exploring that with them is up to, is sort of, important that we take their voice into account versus what we think is good for them. And we're gonna see how this sometimes doesn't happen around things of employment and sometimes how it does. Um, so as, as service providers, for, for those of us who work, you know, sort of supporting people with meeting goals that, they, that they're hoping to meet, the spirit of recovery, the ethos of it, returns us to, to them first. It's not, it's not a predetermined set of outcomes where somebody achieves recovery when they've met these you know x y and z sort of domains of living um it's more about which what they want to meet how they want to get there and often employment is one of those um and it's not always addressed 
in the clinical setting as we're gonna as we're gonna see. Um, and I think for me that's that's it before we pass it on to, to Mark. Well, thank you so much, Kendall. Uh, thanks for, for the for the start of this conversation. Um, which I think is not an easy conversation in the sense that we are raising more questions than providing answers. And our main question is, uh, is employment uh, something that we should, we should offer the opportunity of employment for everybody with a serious mental illness, everybody receiving services? Uh, how to do this? Who is responsible for it? You know? um, so, Part of the, the issue regarding this question is that despite years of effort to promote vocational rehabilitation for people with serious mental illness, as of today, um, we have around 20% of people diagnosed with a serious mental illness are receiving services for uh, serious mental illness. 20% are employed when in several different um, surveys, more than 60% say that they would like to, to work. And this, this number is very well established. If we look into articles, this is what we will find. And five years ago, we, we were involved in the evaluation of an expansion of support employment services in the state of Connecticut. And we came across uh, a difficult issue because Connecticut offers support employment services to around 3% of people receiving uh, mental health services through uh, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction uh, Services, DEMAS. Um, and we wanted to, or, or DEMAS wanted to expand this to at least 8%. But there were some, in, in the support employment services provided, there were some open slots. So there was this question about why were we, or why should we expand services when there are some open slots in specific uh, uh, support employment services in the state of Connecticut. Um, in dealing with this question, we decided to do a couple of surveys. Um, we did a survey with providers and then we did survey with people receiving services to try to better understand uh, how important employment was or how important employment was viewed by providers and by people receiving services. And this is what we'd like to present. I think what we'd like to, to come out of this, is our overarching uh, objective is to, is to think of employment, for us to expand employment for people receiving psychiatric services. Uh, employment needs to be a job of everybody. The, this, this idea that if someone wants employment, they should go to the support employment specialist and clinicians should not be involved in, uh, in talking about employment. This provides, uh, employment for some, but a lot of people ends up not finding uh, the job that they might want to. So in this presentation today, we'd like to talk about, um, we'd like to talk about the survey, the surveys that we did, and more specifically, the survey that we did with people receiving mental health services uh, at the Department of Mental Health and addiction services in Connecticut. So um, we talked about uh, support employment services last week. I'm not going to go to over it again. Um, we had done uh, providers and a family survey services and uh, providing surveys, uh, uh, provider family survey about employment and what we learned from those uh, surveys was that uh, for providers and family having a sense of whole purpose, meaningful meaning in life 
and believing in oneself as a capable person are very important for people's recovery. Uh, employment is viewed as offering the persons a value social uh, role uh, and also a positive sense of identity. That encouragement is very important for people to find employment. For providers and family members, employment is not viewed as a source of stress, nor as increasing a person's risk of lapse. But employment in a competitive job and being financially independent were not viewed as important for people's recovery. So when we, when we sent out the survey to providers and then we did the segue with family members, we, we were intrigued by this issue that everybody believed that having a meaningful role was important for people's recovery, but employment was not really viewed as important for people's uh, recovery. Um, so today we want to focus a little bit more on the consumer survey that we did with people receiving mental health services in the DEMA system in Connecticut. Um, the survey was composed of 90 statements. Uh, we built the survey using a participatory methodology. Um, and the statements address four main topics. Um, what is important for, for people, what is important in helping people get and keep a paid job? What were the barriers to getting a job? What is helpful for people's recovery? And what is most important in receiving services? Uh, we had responses from almost 600 uh, consumers from 48 different agencies in Connecticut. Um, a little bit more men than, than women uh, uh, answered the survey. 50% were uh, Hispanic and or Latinx, 25% African Americans. In analyzing the responses of the survey, we saw that there were three, um, three, three main groups of respondents to the survey, and we analyzed the survey based on these three responses. Uh, there were people who were currently receiving, uh, who were currently employed, receiving services, they were currently employed. There were people who wanted to be employed, and there were those who were receiving services, but they were not looking for a job and they would not like to be employed. And the majority of the respondents were receiving services for five or more years. Um, so we analyzed the results of this survey based on which category they 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 met if they were working if they were looking for a job or if they were receiving services but they were not interested in working so um, the first the first question that we asked participants was uh how important each of the statements were for, for helping them keep or, or, or find a job. So for those who were working, what they say was really helpful for them to find and keep their job was to have uh, the employment specialist to help them explore job as soon as possible. Um, setting the goal of obtaining a competitive job, having an employment specialist uh, pay attention to their preferences, participating in supporting employment program that take into account their needs and hopes, having the provider understand that working would offer a valuable role or would be an important source of positive self-esteem and having an employment specialist 
uh, who could work with them as long as they needed. So for those working, we can clearly see that the role of the employment specialist is very important in helping them find a job and keep their jobs. For those who would like to work, um, we can see also the statements about the importance of the employment specialist. But there is also this interest in getting out of poverty. You know, so one of the reasons that people would like to look for a job and find a job is this sense or this hope, the sense that they would like to move out of, out of poverty. Um, and again, setting a goal to obtain a capital job, participating in support and employment. Um, this question gets a little bit, uh, I would say, it's a little bit tricky for those who, who, who don't want to work, like if you ask a person who don't want to work, what would help them find a job and keep a job makes a little bit counterintuitive, but even so they answer this question and they say that uh, having, the, the, having providers understand that they need to wait, so they're it's the sense that they are not ready to, to, to work. Um, personalized counseling about benefits would be very important for them to, to think of uh, finding a job. Uh, having providers understand that working uh, would offer a valuable role or would be an important source of positive self-esteem. So if they see that a job could provide this valuable role, they, this would be an important issue for them to find a job. Um, getting out of poverty and having provided understand that getting a job would be too stressful. So still, there's the sense of, for those who don't want to work, there's the sense that job is stressful and, and, and they're not ready for it. <clears throat> what is not important for finding and keeping a job. So for those working, uh, it's not important for them to understand that, of course, the job is stressful, uh, that working could increase their risk of collapse. They don't think so. Then they think that working increases the, the, the risk of collapse is important here, that the involvement of family members is not seen as important for people to find a job. Uh, Having peers involved, uh, this was puzzling for us because part of what we were trying to move forward with and it's something for us to, to consider as a strategy and how to do this was uh, the involvement of peer support as something that could help people find jobs. Now we're, for, for, for the respondents for this survey, uh, peer support was not seen and probably because this is not something that is ongoing. So peer support services uh, might not be so involved in helping people find jobs. So this is not built by people receiving services as something that is helpful because it is not done this way. Um, and uh, talking with clinicians and employment specialists about stigma and discrimination. So for those who are working, conversation about stigma and discrimination were not helpful for them to, to find a job. Um, at least what not, was not as valued. For those who are looking for a job, what, what is not important, again, uh, the view of job is too stressful, uh, risk of relapse, uh, involving family members, um, having the peer involved, and which is very similar to those two groups. And and waiting until, uh, until stability. Um, these were not viewed as, as important for them to find a job. Um, and for those who don't want to work, um, again, they don't see involvement of family members as important. Um, having uh, peers involved, uh, again, setting the goal of obtaining a competitive job because after all, they at this point don't, are not looking for a job or not interested in finding a job, being encouraged. So for those who, who 
are not looking for a job, encouragement to find a job is not as important. And um, having providers understand that getting a job would be an important step in their recovery. What is interesting here is, at least for me, who I, I, I worked in the past several years as a clinician, um, I always thought that involving family members would always be helpful. And at least for, for the respondents to this survey, this is not the case. The second question that we addressed with the survey um, was um, what, what were the barriers? What were the barriers to find a job? For, for those who are working, Benefits, being afraid of losing benefits is very important. And we will see that benefits is a huge barrier to, to, for people to, to, to find a job or, or to look for a job and something that definitely needs to be uh, addressed uh, in order for people to, to, to be able to, to look for a job. Um, discrimination is an important barrier for people to, to find and keep their jobs. Uh, the participation in supporting employment program. And, and this is also um, something that we thought that was not, not well understood because uh, the statement of supporting employment service uh, program could be understood as protective jobs. And also this is something that we, we we have debated about the meaning of participation in support employment services as employment specialists have, uh, uh, those who are working, they have stated that the employment specialist is very helpful for them to, to find and keep their jobs. Uh, other barrier was uh, disclosure. So disclosure we've been talking about, but it's something that everybody needs to help with how to address disclosure, how to talk to, to employers, how to, to address this issue uh, with employers, um, and not having a sense of belonging or being valued in the workplace. Uh, and there is the issue of, of stress as something that might get in the way of keeping the job. For those who are looking for, for work, what gets in the way is uh, again uh, being afraid of losing health insurance and benefits, um, uh, participating in support employment program, which I addressed. Uh, person uh, discrimination against again and uh, sense of belonging uh, and disclosure. So discrimination, disclosure, uh, benefits. These are important issue issues and these are issues that everybody needs to to not only to address but uh, to come up with a plan on how to address it and for those who don't want to work um, what's what gets in the way of them uh, looking for a job is this idea that they feel that they are too ill or disabled to work uh, being afraid of losing uh, health insurance and benefits, stress, um, they feel that job could be too stressful, uh, being afraid of discrimination, uh, disclosure, and, and trauma that would make working extremely, histories of trauma that would make work, work extremely difficult. So again, across the three groups, uh, discrimination, uh, disclosure, um, uh, and, and, and the benefits. These are, are very important topics. So what, what, is not, what doesn't get in the way, and, and we put those statements, but they were not valued or they were not rated as high. Uh, I'm not going to take too long over here. Uh, paperwork. Uh, substance use and disappear because we, we think that, or we believe that majority of respondents, because they were from uh, mental health services, they didn't have problems with alcohol and drugs, so they didn't view this as something important. Uh, 
feeling unreliable to work, this is not important, um, not being interested in working, and, and uh, relapse issue, we already talked a little bit about this. Um, those who would like to work, again, the, the substance use problem doesn't seem to be an issue for, for people who are in the mental health side of things, uh, not being interested in working, um, feeling unreliable, kind of similar. And for those who don't want to work, um, not being accepted in employment services in the past uh, is not an issue. So the, their history of not working is not seen as a main barrier. Uh, not having family support was not seen as a main barrier. Um, and the, their previous experience of work, but this was not issues that they raised as getting in the way for them. Um, so the third main question um, that we asked, what was important for their recovery? Um, and for those who are working, and we will see this across the three segments, and this is something very important for us to raise here, is that everybody viewed as their clinical care, the medical care, as very important in their recovery, uh, but also say, having a sense of home, uh, being financially independent was very important, um, taking control of their own life. For those who are working, being able to control their own life, independency, uh, and having good clinical uh, service, these were viewed as very important for their recovery. For those who would like to, to work, again, uh, the quality of the clinical care, uh, this is very important for them. Having a sense of purpose and meaning in life, control of their own lives, uh, believing in themselves as a capable person, and being financially independent. This is something that would, were, was rated as important for their recovery. Uh, for those who don't want to work uh, or not looking for a job, what is important for their recovery was sense of home, quality of, of medical care, uh, clinical care, stable housing, believing in themselves as a capable person, regardless of, of they not wanting to work was seen as very important and having a sense of purpose and meaning in life. So going back to what Kendo started uh, talking, recovery have, have different uh, ways of being recovery and not necessarily uh, employment should be linked to purpose and meaning in life. For some, employment might be uh, a mean or purpose in life, but for others, it is not. And there are other uh, purposes and meaning in life that are not necessarily linked to employment. <clears throat> what was not rated very high uh, as important for their recovery what was interesting here is intimate relationship, a romantic relationship was not viewed as important. Support from family, this came across also the three groups, uh, being connected to something larger uh, than themselves, spirituality was not ranked as the most important items in recovery, uh, eliminated symptoms and being employed. So it's interesting that even for those who are working, employment and being employed in a competitive job is not filled as the top, uh, the type uh, statements related to their recovery. For those who are uh, would like to work, what was not rated as very important for their recovery. Again, what repeats here, the, the romantic relationship, spirituality, having support from their family, um, drug and alcohol, employment, and eliminating all symptoms of mental illness. And for those who are not looking for a job or don't want to work, what is not rated as the most important item for their recovery? Being employed, involved in a romantic relationship, uh, drug and alcohol, 
um, being connected to something larger than them than themselves, separate from the family, and eliminating all mental illness or all symptoms of mental illness. <clears throat> and finally, the final question that they addressed with the survey. Um, the degree to which uh, each service is an important part of what you receive from service providers. So what are the important services that they receive? For those who are working, the important services that they receive are, are related to encourage to self-care and wellness, uh, get, uh, get help and, and and uh, get help for, for finding and keeping a job. Uh, refer me for help to get and keep a job. These were important part of the services they were receiving. Uh, help me get and keep housing. Refer me to help and get and keep housing and refer to medical care. For those who would like to work, the, the services that they view as very important was again, services related to, to employment, such as helping get and keep a job, uh, case management services, um, ref being referred to, to help and, and get or keep a job, encouragement, encourage myself uh, to self-care and wellness, housing, uh, and help me with advocacy, uh, legal issues, problems with ben benefits and entitlements. So those who are trying to find a job, they view also uh, benefits and entitlements and, and services around these issues as very important. And for those who don't want to work, um, the services that they view as very important to them are related to case management, psychotherapy, and psychological interventions encourage uh, for self-care and wellness, um, decide what mental health conditions I have, uh, uh, for example, diagnosis, uh, help me get or keep housing and refer me for help with advocacy, legal issue problems with benefits. So those who don't want to work also feel uh, Legal issues, benefits, entitlement as important in, their, in the services that they receive. Um, what was not rated as high uh, in the services that they receive, for those who are working, substance use, uh, alcohol, um, extending information about personal and family history, involvement of family members, uh, help me to make friends or have fun with other people, discuss, discuss with me any experiences of domestic violence, abuse, and our trauma that I might have current experience or have experienced in the past. So this would not feel as important in the services that they were receiving. For those who would like to work, uh, the services that, that they didn't view as very important, that uh, the services that they were receiving were, again, with, with uh, being referred to alcohol and substance use treatment, involvement of family members, experience of domestic violence, uh, refer to making friends or having fun, and extensive information about my personal and family history. And for those who would like to work, uh, sorry, this is for those who are not working. Um, yeah, I think, well, I, I, I somehow we missed the, the, this is the same uh, slide, so somehow I will, I will, I, I missed the, the, which is not rated as important for those who would not like to work, but it's kind of similar uh, there were, we, we didn't see much difference across the three groups. So in wrapping up, um, the takeaway messages uh, from, from our survey here is that there's no single story uh, and people may change. Um, 
the relationship between recovery and employment is particular to each person. Um, service users do not link recovery with employment. For some, financial security is an important motivation to find a job. Fear of losing benefits is a substantial barrier when considering employment. Um, for some, employment is associated with having a place in the world, uh, agency control, meaning. For some, employment is not an immediate interest. Family and peers are not as important as direct employment services in finding, keeping a job. Um, disclosure and discrimination at workplace are perceived as important barriers. So with this said, um, I'm going to end our presentation and ask if you have any questions and give segue to a conversation. Thank you so much. And I'll Thank stop you. sharing my screen. Thank you, Mark and Kendall, for, for that presentation. And, and before we, we open it up for just questions and answers, Mark, I, I do want to note that um, throughout the presentation, I noticed that there seem to be a couple of themes throughout the responses. And, I, I, and broadly speaking, when we think about how we're providing, how, how effective are we providing support or services to individuals who are seeking employment services, one of the things that came across the the surveys and, and how they were answering is that depending at the stage that they were at, if we want to think about stages of change, which is depending where the individual that we're working with, where they're at, we're going to provide different types of services. Right? So for example, it seemed like those who were working seemed to want it, seemed to, who, for those individuals who were working, it seemed like those that they wanted more of a growth approach. They wanted to be supported in a way that was more emotionally based and going to help them continue to grow in various areas of their lives. That was something that I, I noticed across the, some of the, the questions that, as a theme. And then for, for those who were, who, were seeking, who were seeking employment, it, it sounded like they were, wanting, they were wanting support that was more tangible, more hands-on. How can, you know, how, how can I um, be employed or, or how is the application process? So it seems like they wanted more of a tangible kind of a process. And then for those who were not interested or who didn't want to work, it sounded like they were, they were more interested in one, feeling validated and feeling heard, and then wanting to possibly know more or have more knowledge and information about the actual process. So it sounds like they were at different stages and wanting they required or would like different types of support that would meet their needs. That was something that I, I saw across a, a, as theme um, and, the, and then the overall takeaway from the presentation, it sounded as though it's important to meet the individual where they're at and understand what is, what is their overall purpose in wanting employment and, and being okay with that. Um, so I think that was the, the overall takeaway message for me is that there's different various levels and meeting them where they're at would be an initial step and then maybe using some some strategies to kind of evoke some to evoke just an understanding of where they're at. I don't know if that that was what um, how you all interpret. That was just a bit kind of like my own way of understanding and trying to like wrap it up um, before we move we move to question and answers. Is it okay to respond to that? I, I think I think that's um, I think that's actually spot on in in the and putting on both sort of a, a former provider's hat and a, and a service user hat. I think the, one of the important things is, is um, there's a lot of pressure when you're working to sort of do things a certain way. And, and, and so the, we know that IPS and other supported employment programs work. We know that they're, they're, they're you know, the, the best we have in terms of helping people and supporting them in the job, but there's sort of this black box of what do you do inside of those and what do you do if you're a, if you're a clinician and you're not directly working with supported employment like how does how does that link and one thing we're seeing and i saw this in the results and actually the slides that are underlined on recovery the the purpose of that underline was to highlight how recovery has become given as clinical language not to highlight what recovery is just in case as, as people look 
look over those slides when they get them. And the, the thing, recovery, because it's given to you when you enter services, it's not a word you're using, um, you sort of start to associate it with your services, with medical care, with showing up for appointments, with, with things like that. And that's not, that's sort of not what was meant by it. And I know for providers who are doing the best they can, usually with limited resources, the question becomes, well, what do I do? You know, I have the, I have to, I have to meet this person where they are, and I have to deliver recovery-oriented services. And and people are at different points at different times, and that's important for us to remember that the evidence-based practices work when that's what a person, because they're supposed to be what a person's choosing. They work when the person wants that particular service. And so, if in a clinical setting somebody is talking about they, them wanting to go to work. What the survey shows us in part is that it's not about symptom management to them. They want to go to work. They, don't, they may not link it to recovery because that isn't the language that was given to them. And the same for providers who are being trained since recovery. In the past 20 years, recovery has been in the, in the conversation in a lot of places. So, so linking it to recovery automatically or not linking it stops being the important thing. If, if somebody comes to you and says they want to work, then explore that with them as a clinician and know where you can refer them so that the, 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 the specialist, the support and employment person who knows how to do the work can help them. And likewise, if they're not ready to work, that's not something to push or not to push, but it is something to explore with them. Why is that? Can those barriers, are those things that, that they want to overcome? Or is it simply that they have other things that bring them meaning and where they are and, and sort of that clinical judgment and practice wisdom has to enter in to evidence-based practices to, to serve the people well. And that's why we're here is to serve them well. That makes complete sense. And, and I think you're, you're spot on that it sounds as though that it, it's become more, more of, a, of an end. It sounds like recovery has become, and even with employment, like the idea of having employment becomes the end goal versus it being a process. And, and maybe shifting our thinking that Yes, while we're obtaining our, while we're obtaining objectives or attaining goals, that's part of the overall process. Like it's a, it's a long life journey versus it like being a final here's the outcome and boom we're done. It's it's like it's an overall process versus an outcome. And, and in addition to it, there's also this sense of seeking independence and at the same time also continuing to have that support just in case versus it just being there's possibly this fear of like oh I'm gonna go out to this world and there's a potential of a loss. Like while I'm gaining, I'm also losing. So what do I fall back on just in case, right? So there's maybe possibly a sense of fear as well. And 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 it sounds like it's it would be important to for for you know providers that are at all service and all types of levels for for the, the service to be more holistic versus separated and individualized versus you know it sounds like folks are are wanting to have a team around them, have uh, a team that's supportive and is in the know of, of everything versus it being kind of disjointed and, and, and kind of, you know, be feeling supported in one area, not in the other. It's wanting to be on the same page. Is that kind of what Yeah, I and say? I think also, so that we, we, we talk about the whole person sometimes and forget that, that for all of us, regardless of psychiatric status, um, sometimes we're ambivalent Sometimes we want something, but we need we need support in order to because we're scared. And there's there's so putting on the lived experience hat. There there is there's not a lot that is unique to be to having a psychiatric disability that isn't when it comes to sort of these these sorts of goals mm -hmm. in living that's unique to that experience. But the the support and the fear are sometimes in intensified because there is discrimination and there is bias and there is stigma and there and a lot of opportunities get lost along the way that may not be lost for for everybody else or for what what is perceived as sort of normal or I like to use the word ordinary instead of normal but um like there there it's not that there's this this qualitative well there may be a qualitative difference of some kind but it's not it's not a difference in who we are as human beings. We want the same things. And so as a provider, if I can imagine what it would be, I can't imagine what it would be like not to have certain things in place. And also, yeah, I mean, it, so the whole person is, is having the team and having the right people to support me in place or, or the person in place, but also realizing that ambivalence or fear or even failure, failure is not the end of the world. So I try something and it doesn't work, it's too stressful, a new job. 
that doesn't mean I can't work or that I shouldn't work or even that that's a loss. That's a learning experience. It, it's an opportunity. And for some people, it may also be devastating. It, we can't, it's not the same thing for everybody. And that's where as individual providers, I think the gift comes. Mm -hmm. it, it keeps it from being a technology that we just apply in a manualized way. It's the piece that gets, it's part of evidence-based practices is the person-centeredness and taking the person's values and working with them, mm -hmm. sharing, sharing. That's part of the, the core of, of developing evidence-based practices, but it gets left out when it becomes just sort of technical. And I'm going to imagine that providers listening know that. That they and that they run up against st structural barriers mm -hmm. in doing that, mm -hmm. but that they know it. I want to remind them that it's good that they do it. Yeah, I, I like to add a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, what I like about this the service is that it was random and it distributed throughout Connecticut, and we got numbers that reflect what other surveys have said, where we got kind of um, around six. 70% of people who would like to work or are working. And we got around 30% of people who say they, they are not ready for, they don't want to work, or this is not what they're looking for. And around those who want to work or are working, the majority are still not working. So this is something that it, 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 bothers me because this should not be the case you know if 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 someone's the majority of people who who say they would like to work there should be a way of uh, having the majority of them at least uh working so this is uh i think what still uh bothers me um i think Another important point is that how um, people receiving services, how they view their their clinical, their clinicians, uh, their providers, how they view them as important in, in their process. So this is something that we need to 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 emphasize. Uh, clinical work is viewed as very important for people, and and something that we cannot or we should not. Um, uh, our, our, we, 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 we should not let this without an emphasis. And, and the other point um, that I like to, to make is for those who were able to find a job, they value the, the work of the employment specialists very much. You know? so, so these are things that could be talked about, worked about as a team, you know, because at least for those who find, found on the job, the pet seems to, on one side, uh, valuing their their wellness. Wellness and self-care is viewed as very important. So this was one point. The, the work of the employment specialist was viewed as, as also very important. And the third issue, which is difficult for, I would say, for clinicians to address per se, because this is something that is beyond the clinical setting is something uh, in the community and at the employment side is the issue re related to discrimination and related to self-disclosure and 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 these issues we, we need to 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 move forward in how to address discrimination because even those who are working discrimination is still a very important issue for them you know so they are working but uh, discrimination is is a barrier, uh, and for those who are not considering uh, the idea of working, part of the reason might be linked to discrimination and trauma at the at the workplace. So, so these are, are issues that um, we need sort of everybody to help us better understand how to address these issues. Thank you, Mark. Um, I, I noticed that we, I wanna be mindful of folks this time and um, I wanna make sure that folks have an opportunity to ask questions and, and for us to be able to answer them. We have about roughly close to six minutes or so. So 
um, if you're able to maybe type your questions in the chat box that you would are, are interested in us kind of discussing that we welcome it. Um, yeah. So I'll wait to see if there's anything that comes up um, in the discussion part. In the meantime, while some of them come in, you know, Mark, I think one of the things that you mentioned that is very critical is the importance of how, how can how can you know providers at all different levels and and all different types of services help or you know at at a, at a micro level because um, there's always systems in place that make it difficult at least at, at a micro level or an individual level. How can we maybe start? helping developing skills to navigate experiences of discrimination that come along with stigma and so on that that is very critical and and i think that is something that's important for 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 it to be processed and addressed and at the same time provide some skills in terms of how to navigate those experiences yeah i i think those conversations they need to happen and and they should move i think beyond the clinical setting you know in the sense that if someone who I work with has been discriminated or they're talking about this, how can we escalate this conversation to a systems level conversation, you know? How can this be discussed with the CEO, with the director, with the coordination of my team, you know? And how this can also be addressed because um, if employers are still discriminating, against uh, people who have a mental health uh, experience, experience of mental health issues, uh, are, are we setting them to, you know, to, to go through stress? Because being discriminated is very stressful, you know? It's not something cool, it's not something that it, it's easy to deal with, you know? So, if someone says that they are being discriminated in the workforce, how can we take this to a another level instead of instead of addressing it just clinically? It's, it is important in, in in the clinical setting to talk about, to discuss, to 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 share thoughts and strategies. But discrimination is something that should not be addressed only on the individual level. You know, we need to build strategies to address this in the systems level as well. Definitely, yeah. Go for candle. I was just gonna say, I I think there's there's also there's there's a fear of discrimination, not not discrimination of 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 well bias. I I think most stigma is discrimination, but there's also that the internalized sense that there there is often a tendency when you're working or in any environment to to sort of um, you know once you hear what people think they know about you to to read it in where it it's happening less than you think and i this i, I know with with psychiatric stuff this happens where you're you respond as though you're you're always on guard you're always on guard for that that moment when when you're going to be discovered and the survey sort of showed the fear even among people not working is there and it's there among people that are working, although it appeared to be lower ranked among people who are actually working. So helping people navigate that fear, and it doesn't have to be, this is for clinical providers, not, well, also supported employment providers, but depending on where the person is, helping them, that's a really important part to living well in your community is being able to walk around the world without shame, right, or without fear of, of who you are, what somebody's gonna say, and that plays a bigger role for people people sometimes than I think is acknowledged because we like to think we've normalized and moved on but it's actually can be quite intensified and when you so it's a way that it doesn't if the person isn't ready to work but they're talking about that sort of stuff that's one way to explore it and and it doesn't have to move them to work if that's mm -hmm. not what they want but it could if that's the main barrier and for people who are working it may help mm -hmm. keep jobs and help them stay and and be more Feel more solid and livable. Yeah, I definitely agree with that in that sense that while while as we know systems take long, they take time to change. 
have, and unfortunately the onus is put on the individual, at, at least having, providing, you know, various types of supports and skills to navigate these systems until they change sounds to be important um, in doing this work at different levels of services and providers. Well, well thank you so much. I, I want to thank you both for, for, for sharing such rich information and for being here with us. And again, I want to be mindful of folks' time. Um, and you know we can we can start to to wrap up and I think we have about a, a minute or so so if there are any final thoughts we'll we'll end there uh, thank you so much I think work is a job of everybody something for us to, to talk about um, and it's possible for people to have meaningful life even without working as well and we need to also take this deeply into Thank you, Mark. Um, and with that being said, I think we're at the hour. And thank you, everyone, for being here with us. We appreciate your time. And, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye.